So was there any active resistance to the Red Scare? Um, there wasn't much. Uh, because Again, we were in war. And when we're in war, people allow, in the name of national security, First Amendment rights to be restricted. And so uh, we had this problem of people being incarcerated and then tried and uh, examined for whether they were seeking the violent overthrow of the government. And if there were, they could, they could be locked away. So how might this differ in terms of the history from the alien and sedition crisis? Well, in, in, uh, an interesting thing happened uh, in, during the communist movement and the socialist movement, the anarchist movement. Two cases went to the Supreme Court. And in one, they said, you're trying to arrest this man simply because he's writing his opinion. And he can have the opinion that the government of the United States should change. The other case that came forward, uh, the man actually wrote pamphlets that asked people not to register for the draft that Woodrow Wilson put in place for World War I. And they found that to be dangerous. And that's the test that uh, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great jurist, Mm -hmm. came up with, and that is, if this presents a clear and present danger, then I can incarcerate you for your speech. So how did this crisis come to any resolution then if there wasn't any opposition to the putting in prison of people who were accused of being read? Well, I think part of the resolution came from the Supreme Court in this case, where uh, they found what is harmful speech as opposed to what isn't harmful speech, and that gave a, a kind of resolution to the issue. The other uh, reason the issue got resolved was that the, the Soviet Union survived and uh, eventually it was realized that the, the internal threat to the United States was not very great. Uh, people forget that Woodrow Wilson sent uh, a division of troops into the Russian Revolution on the side of the Democrat uh, Menshevik movement. Uh, and that offended the Soviet Union, and that was the beginning of our hostile relations with the Soviet mm -hmm. Union that didn't get repaired until World War II, and then that would come undone again, too. So what are some of the lessons that you think we can learn from today from this Red Scare era? Well, I think we need to examine uh, whether a scare is, is real or not and, and how heightened it is. But, I, I mean, I, I can't fault people for getting upset because the Attorney General's house was blown up. Uh, or that the President of the United States was assassinated in 1901. Uh, those are real threats, and something has to be done about them. What we probably should learn is that the threats can be exaggerated. We can, we can go after people because of their associates, and guilt by association should never be allowed uh, to be a reason to incarcerate someone. Okay, so this seems to be a recurring theme throughout history, that there's a, a threat of violence and, and that our First Amendment freedoms are, are restricted. One of the things that current Americans are worried about is terrorism because of our post 9-11 society. So what are some of the things that you think happened immediately after 9-11 that are potential threats to our freedom of expression? Well, uh, you know, this was an attack on, on American soil in, in an American state. I mean, when, it was, this, you know, a, a very frightening thing that these planes are flying around and, and actually, uh, you know, killing over 2,000 people. Uh, and something needed to be done about that. Uh, the danger for me came when the legislation, the U.S. Pa Patriot Act, was passed so quickly uh, without examination. I mean, even after uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Congress took a long time to come up and devise the legislation. They did some bad things, but uh, in this case, the legislation just flew through the Congress without examination, and there were a few things in there, like going after people's library records and being able to tap the phone without a, a warrant. Uh, that seemed to me to be a little excessive. Uh, but one can understand it in the context of 9-11 at that time. So throughout our history, we've learned that it takes several years sometimes for the resolution of the crisis to come to an end. Assuming that there's any resolution to the war on terrorism in the foreseeable future, how do you think that our First Amendment might come out? Well, I think that terrorism is different. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a threat that isn't identified directly with a political party. It isn't identified directly with an international movement. I mean, obviously Al-Qaeda is international, but it, 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 they're not out in the open. It, it's kind of a hidden thing. And, and instead of demonstrating um, they're, they're involved in uh, random acts of terror uh, that make them difficult to plot. Uh, and, and technology has made everything much more sophisticated. The use of cell phones to create clubs and nest people inside of movements um, make it very difficult. And, and I think that's why a lot of people would say, in, in the name of national security, you know, for the security of my family, I'm willing to give up some of the rights 
that I've had before, that may become a necessity because of the sophistication of worldwide terrorism. Well, it seems like what we've learned so far from the labor movement up until the post 9-11 area, that, that, this, that this terror seems to be a recurring theme. You, yes. One could kind of see the anarchist movements involved in terror at the particular time of the labor movements up into the current time. So do you think that terrorism is really just a recent manifestation of the same phenomenon that's been occurring all along? Yeah, I do. I, I mean, we, we saw it uh, before in the French Revolution that uh, the, the first time the term terrorist and terrorism is used is when Edmund Burke talks about the French Revolution. And then we see it again in the anarchist movement, and we see it again in the communist movement. Uh, the difference is, as we move through time, the weapons get more sophisticated, the weapons get more devastated. I mean, hijacking four planes and, and crashing them into buildings is, is pretty wild stuff compared to what we were talking about during the French Revolution. And so that, I think, is a difference. The, the, the level of sophistication of communication between groups and the kind of terror that they can visit on people becomes a problem. I want to make sure that we can switch gears here a little bit and talk about some of our current uh, First Amendment cases that have been brought before the court. Uh, so can you give us a little bit of background about Morse versus Frederick and the bong hits for Jesus case is how it's all Well, yes, that's a funny case because uh, it was in Alaska and um, a, a student wore a sweatshirt that said bong hits for Jesus while the Olympic flame was being uh, run through. It was a through banner. The, uh, a banner. banner. Uh, uh, yeah. While the, the Olympic flame was being run through mm -hmm. the town, and the school had let the students go to this event, mm -hmm. so it was like a school event. And so the question was, could they expel the student for holding up this banner mm -hmm. uh, that said bong hits for Jesus? And then the Supreme Court looked at the case and said uh, that in order to keep order in the classroom, the school had a right to do that. Uh, it was a very close case in my mind because they weren't in school, they were out on the street, and what does bong hits for Jesus mean anyway? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you know that that's a threat? But the, ever since the Tinker case in 1969, uh, in, in, in the Tinker case, uh, Tinker versus uh, Des Moines, uh, the Supreme Court said that students do not lose their First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse door. They keep them. But since then, they've been backing off and giving the uh, high schools and elementary schools more control. And this is just one more case of where that control now extended outside the school and onto the street. So where do you think First Amendment rights for students is heading in the future? I think it depends on the court and, and, and how they look at it. Um, I, I thought the Morris decision was wrong-headed. Uh, I, I think they were punishing a, a rather incidental thing and, and that that was incompatible with the Tinker case from 1969. Uh, but with a conservative court, you're going to get give the control to the school. With a liberal court, you may get more defense of students. So it's just going to depend on who controls the court. And in another recent case, Citizens United, yeah. uh, would you maybe give a little bit of background to this case and your thoughts on that? Citizens United overturned the 1906 decision, uh, the legislation of 1906 that Teddy Roosevelt and the Congress put into effect that said corporations were not people and therefore corporate, and the, and the 14th Amendment says people specifically and persons specifically, it does not name mm -hmm. corporations. So Teddy Roosevelt and the Congress restricted corporations from giving uh, in federal campaigns. As time went by, the law was amended, and eventually labor unions and corporations were prohibited uh, from giving money in a campaign. And then an interest group made a documentary about Hillary Clinton and ran it, uh, tried to run it uh, on cable uh, during the, 2000 election the 2008 election campaign. And uh, the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission, ruled that it was a violation of the law because this had been made by a corporation. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court overturned everything, all almost 100 years, over 100 years, uh, and said corporations are made up of people. Uh, there's no compelling interest to keep them out of the marketplace of ideas, and therefore corporations and unions can now contribute all they want in federal election campaigns. And do you think that they were justified in doing so? Um, I think it's the correct reading of the First Amendment. I don't think it's good public policy, and maybe we ought to consider an amendment in that regard. It's a very close call when you, when you start calling entities like that people. Now, they didn't go that far. They said it's con it consists of people, and their rights have to be protected. The corporation's rights have to be protected uh, short of some compelling government interest. The compelling government interest is influence peddling, of course, but you have to prove that. 
and there are laws against that. So the Supreme Court said there is a safeguard there, so let's give corporations and unions the freedom everybody else has. Okay, I'd like to start concluding here. What are some of the major threats that you see in the 21st century to our freedom of expression as we move forward? Well, I've always thought one threat was political correctness, that there were certain things you couldn't say because it might hurt somebody's feelings. Uh, it's not good to hurt people's feelings, but it's not illegal. And uh, pushing political correctness on our campuses and uh, in, in, in corporate areas restricts speech, and I think it's a kind of uh, social violation uh, of the First Amendment. Uh, another violation that we've, we've faced consistently is indecency. Um, there is an obscenity standard that's been clearly established by the court. Uh, indecency is not clearly established and can be used in an arbitrary and capricious way. We say something is indecent, we say violence is indecent, and suddenly we're censoring things that people ought to be allowed to see. And I think that needs to be cleared up by the court, and it hasn't been. Are there any other important topics that you'd like to talk about that are in your book, Silencing the Opposition, that we haven't talked about today? Well, I, I think the whole issue of campaign funding, which you got into a little bit on, on Citizens United, is, is, is very important. The, the, there has been an imposition of rules on campaigns, on federal campaigns, that I think have consistently violated uh, the First Amendment. Uh, we've gotten rid of some of them. Uh, we've gotten around others, allowing major candidates to debate one another without including minor candidates. Um, but there are still, the, the Congress keeps trying to clamp down on campaigns in, in ways that uh, I think uh, restrict speech, and, and we need to be very careful about that and, 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 and keep that open. And you also talk about the Vietnam War era, and yeah. you talk about Native American rights throughout history. There's a whole lot of other material that is covered in the particular book. Yeah, we don't, ha we don't have the greatest record in, 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 in some of these. We didn't give First Amendment rights to Native Americans until 1925, uh, and they were horribly suppressed uh, up, up until that time. And, so, uh, and, and even to this day, certain practices, uh, religious practices by Native Americans are, are forbidden, even though in the First Amendment it says you have the right to freely exercise your religion. So we have work to do. I'd like to thank you very much for speaking with me today. Again, my name is Dr. Kevin A. Johnson, and I've been speaking with Dr. Craig R. Smith from the Center for First Amendment Studies at Cal State University, Long Beach, about his book, Silencing the Opposition. I hope that you enjoyed our, our broadcast this evening, and I look forward to seeing you next time.